Wonder Woman 84 was a mess. If you watched it once and you didn't think about it, then it's a fun, lighthearted movie with bad action scenes and CGI. It goes for a sort of Raimi Spider-Man tone and doesn't always hit that note, but when it does, those are the movie's best moments. If you do think about the film, you'll realize just how much of a mess the film was. To the point that tackling how much of a mess the film was needs to be handled piecemeal. First, let's focus on some of the dumbest things that make no sense. It's nowhere near an extensive list, but just some of the things that stuck out to me. Also, I'm going into this assuming you've either watched the film or at least know generally what happens in it. 1. Steve Trevor is a body snatcher, and it turns Wonder Woman on. The whole plot of this movie revolves around a wishing stone, and Wonder Woman wishes for Steve back, and to do it, Steve literally wakes up in another dude's body, in his apartment, in his life, uh, look, look, I don't want this review to be too heavy, and more importantly, I don't want to get my ads taken away, so let me try to explain this as vaguely as I possibly can. Steve takes over another man's body, Wonder Woman and Steve do things together that couples do, and it's without the third wheel's knowledge. Let me put this another way. There's a word for what's going on here that would have gotten a lot more buzz if the genders were flipped. The sad thing about all of this is you don't even need this plot point. Like, why have Steve take over somebody else's body? In the movie, the Wishing Stone can literally manifest walls, wind, nuclear warheads, fame, power. It's like super powerful, no rules wishing. Why couldn't Steve just get his own body and appear in Wonder Woman's apartment? The only reason I can think of is because they thought that people would think it's a plot hole that a dead guy is walking around and nobody recognizes him. Which is funny because they chose that plot hole of all the other plot holes in this movie to care about. And it's not even a plot hole. Steve was a World War I pilot. Most people that knew him are dead and the few that are alive are old, war-torn people. If anyone recognized him, he would have just been like, I guess I just have one of those faces, and we'd all move on. It could even be kind of like a jokey scene, like an, oh, you know, it's funny because there's an old guy. Or maybe, better yet, maybe one of them is still alive that he worked with, and he goes to visit them in like a hospital or an old person's home or something. It could have been a joke scene. It could have been a nice scene. It, it, it had potential if you didn't fix it. I mean, it's not unheard of for people today to look like people from a century ago. Sometimes it just happens. It's ironic because the movie has so many plot holes and the one plot hole they actually do care about, A, isn't even really a plot hole, but B, actually creates plot holes and also some really uncomfortable implications for anybody who thinks about it for two seconds. The funniest thing is at the end of the movie, Steve is like dead, or he's pulled out of the guy's body, whatever, and Wonder Woman sees the guy again, this time as himself, not as Steve, and he's wearing clothes that Wonder Woman told Steve not to wear in an earlier scene, and she says that he looks good, like sort of almost hits on him, and then he just goes like, thanks! and then leaves, like he sort of rejects her, which means given the choice, he would not have done the hanky-panky with her. What a mess, man. Point number two, why does Cheetah get two wishes? This isn't like the hugest deal in the world, but I don't know. Like, Is it like she got one wish with the stone, but when the stone becomes Max Lord, her wish counter got reset or something? I don't know. Personally, I think her one wish to be like Diana should have just slowly turned her into Cheetah throughout the movie. Like she's powerful, but it comes at a cost. And that would fit the more corny, Raimi style that the film is going for. It would fit the kind of like, be careful what you wish for theme where you got what you wanted, but it's slowly turning you into a monster. And it'd make a little more sense. Like part of the curse is her slowly watching herself turn into Cheetah. Point three. If Wonder Woman has invisibility powers, why can't she make herself invisible too? We see the invisibility jet makes both of them invisible too. Like, anything inside of the jet becomes invisible. So anything inside of something invisible becomes invisible. So even if Wonder Woman can't directly make herself invisible, why can't she wear armor and make that invisible? Armor like the armor she has in the movie. 
If not that, why not a bunch of long sleeve clothes or a cloak or something? Once you introduce something like invisibility in that way, you're gonna have people wondering why they don't use that all the time. Point four, in the scene where Lord is touching everybody with TV rays, which itself is a plot hole I don't even have the emotional bandwidth to address without getting very angry, why is every single person in the world making selfish wishes? I'm sure one person would be like, I wish world hunger was gone, or I wish war was gone, or diseases were gone, or whatever. Where is that wish? Where are the wishes for world peace? Would those conflict with the nuke wishes? Would they, like, spawn in the nukes and then remove the nukes? Like, which wish would get priority there? Is it like a first come first serve kind of system? Or is it like a last wish counts kind of thing? Uh, it's just... Like, if person A wishes they want to be better than person B, and person B wishes that they want to be better than person A, which wish wins out? See, this is why wishing tends to have rules and tends to not be used by everyone all at once. When you have something like wishing, you want to contain that as much as possible so that people don't ask these questions. So those are some of the things that don't really make any sense. Um, I know that there are more, but those are the big ones that stuck out to me. Now let's get into things that technically make logical sense, but are still dumb. One, the digital effects in this movie are terrible. This one isn't really like a story thing, but I just, I need to mention it somewhere. And this is the best I can think of. To be honest, the first Wonder Woman special effects weren't really that great either. The CGI can be spotty. I think it's because Wonder Woman has more exposed skin than someone like Deadpool. And humans are really good at spotting when something recognizably human looks fake. So CGI skin would look a lot more fake than CGI costume, stuff like that. So I feel like Wonder Woman's already at a disadvantage. But, but even then, they're still not great. I think the worst parts of this movie are the green screen effects. I went back and watched some old superhero movies after Wonder Woman 84, and I can honestly say that Wonder Woman green screens look worse. I don't get it. It was a problem in the first one too, but when I say older, I mean like Ghost Rider. Like Ghost Rider, the 2007 movie with a budget of $110 million, had just as good, if not better, green screens than Wonder Woman 84, a 2020 movie, with a budget nearly double that amount. I, I don't get it. And it's specifically Wonder Woman. Because, I mean, Batman v Superman had some green screen issues for sure. But for the most part, I, I don't know if it's just like the way they film it. But like both Wonder Woman movies specifically have really, really bad green screens. I think that some of the bad green screens are supposed to look like comic book frames. Or be kind of intentionally cheesy and an exaggerated style, you know, and that's fine. I think an exaggerated style can look cool in theory. It's why I like the Speed Racer movie. But Speed Racer stays in cartoon land the entire time. Wonder Woman has certain shots where it becomes this cheesy comic book feel, and then it goes back to heightened reality right afterwards, so it doesn't seem like it's an intentional design choice. It seems like it's a mistake, and it takes you out of the movie. It just looks like a bad green screen. In particular, pay attention to when Wonder Woman is running toward the camera in a close-up shot or flying toward the camera in a close-up shot. It's just awful. Point number two, the 80s. Honestly, this movie could have been set after Batman v Superman and it would not change anything to do with the plot. The socio-political stuff the film tries to do would make sense in our modern age anyway. There aren't any like 80s dance scenes or 80s culture that really pops up at all. The one date that Diana and Steve go on is seeing fireworks, something Steve is amazed by, despite fireworks being a staple of America since 1777 and a staple of China since 800 AD and it being a staple of 80s culture, never. Like, nothing besides some of the fashion choices is really 80s. There's a fight scene in a mall, which could have happened in our world, but, you know, the 80s were popular because of malls, so I guess that's a thing. I don't know. 
it's kind of sad. I have this like really cynical theory that the reason the film is set in the 80s is to excuse any time that it looks bad with, oh, it's trying to be cheesy. Like I genuinely can't think of any other reason why it would be in the 80s. Maybe this film was originally more 80s and then some studio had stepped in and was like, no, uh, take all this out. I know she had to fight for the mall scene and uh, I wish she didn't, but okay. She had to fight for the mall scene. And maybe she lost some fights with some other scenes that were more 80s. I don't know. But it just seems like a waste, to be honest. Point three, uh, Diana being lovesick half a century later. I'm not saying this in a she's a powerful woman who doesn't need a man kind of thing. Because I think that that's kind of a dumb complaint in general. I think that like limiting your stories for reasons like that is just kind of dumb. But if we're looking at Diana as a character, just the story being told here, I don't know. I mean, human beings with human being lifespans move on from dead partners within their lifetime. Diana, meanwhile, is 800 years old. As you get older, you actually perceive time differently. Like, think about how long a year felt as a young kid compared to how fast it flies by as a teenager or even adult. Imagine that, but several tens of times faster, and that should be Wonder Woman's existence. A year wouldn't feel like that much to her. In a way, it kind of makes sense that Wonder Woman doesn't really get out much because to her, you know, a year flies by... It's not a big deal. She's been doing her projects for that long, whatever. But for her to be also grieving Steve Trevor, I don't know. Maybe Amazonian brains work differently. But even aside from all that, her still being sad about her ex is just like, why? Like, like why isn't Diana, like, doing anything at all with her life aside from work? Like, if we saw a Diana that was too busy for a personal life, then okay. If we saw Diana that had a personal life, but she wasn't satisfied with it because no one around her understood her, sure. But for her to put like 50 years on halt because of someone she dated for a week is just, I don't know, man. It doesn't make sense to me. Like, it could make sense logically, maybe for Amazonians, getting over your ex for 50 years is the equivalent of getting over your ex in five months. And by movie logic, a week together is like love at first sight. You know, it could work, but do you see how it requires so much stretching? Do you see how it requires you to, like, do things for the filmmakers? It just, it just doesn't seem right. It just seems like I'm reaching. I don't know. I don't like it. Uh, point three, Diana losing her powers from Steve. I'm not going to get into the fact that it makes for this weird moment where Wonder Woman has to choose between love and a career. I mean, you could see it like that. I wouldn't stop you. You could also hand wave it and say that Wonder Woman is choosing between having something she wants and being a hero, which is kind of like Raimi's Spider-Man. So I'm, I'm not going to comment on that too much. I'm just mentioning it. But, but let's ignore that for a second. Did Wonder Woman need to have less powers at all for this story to function? I'm going to get into this later, but I feel like Wonder Woman was a really good balance between being really, really powerful and being vulnerable. You know, you know that she's going to win, but things are just hard enough for her that it still feels tense. You know, it still feels like you're watching someone. It isn't, it's not just like effortless like Superman. I think keeping her in that middle ground is really the way to go for this series, but if they did have to depower Wonder Woman, the interesting bit would be to see how she adapts to this loss of powers. Maybe she has to use more of her ingenuity. Maybe she gets wrecked by the villain and gets captured and gains her powers back and then fights him. I don't know. Wonder Woman 84 sort of has this, but for the most part, every time she's about to suffer the consequences of her lack of powers, Steve was there to save the day. So, depowering Wonder Woman felt less like Wonder Woman overcoming an obstacle, and more like Wonder Woman being depowered so that Steve would have something to do. It's dumb, but worse, it's unneeded. Steve and Wonder Woman worked alongside of each other in the first movie just fine without Wonder Woman being nerfed. In fact, it made it kind of interesting. Steve was on the ground, you know, maybe shooting one trooper or positioning their soldiers and stuff like that. And Wonder Woman was like taking out groups of guys. It was cool. It was a nice contrast. But now it's like they're both on the same level and, and there's no real point to it at all. And it just seems kind of dumb just for the point of like, be careful what you wish for. I don't know. It's just, I don't like it. Three, Diana flying. I don't like it. I really don't like it at all. Now, before anybody jumps on me, 
you know, for not being a comic book aficionado or whatever. And I'm not. But I do know that she flies in other media. I know that she flies in, like, the Justice League show at least. But I don't like it. And it's not because she doesn't fly in Batman v Superman. As it's clear DC is slowly writing that movie out of continuity anyway. The reasons that I don't like it are as follows. One, it makes the invisibility jet worthless. Like, why fly this if she can fly herself? And two, it will inevitably affect every action scene moving forward, in my eyes, negatively. One thing I really liked about Wonder Woman was not just what she could do, but what she couldn't do. She had super strength, but not like Superman. She was fast, but not like the Flash. She had a lasso, but not a bunch of gadgets to keep track of like Batman. She was just powerful enough to not make her worthless fighting aliens in a Justice League movie, but she wasn't too powerful where street-level crime required no effort. She was a really good balance, like Spider-Man. And like Spider-Man, she couldn't fly. She did, however, have a super jump, and she could swing herself to places to get by. This means she had to be creative with how she got around certain environments. This actually culminated in a really cool scene in Wonder Woman 1 where she needs the help of the troops to get up to a sniper tower. In fact, the whole scene before then, the way she had to jump around and use her jumps to different places as attacks in of themselves, resulted in a really creative fight scene that to me is even more memorable than the No Man's Land scene. Limitations on heroes are just as important as powers. To quote Orson Welles, the enemy of art is the absence of limitations. When you remove those limitations, you actually remove a lot of potential creativity. Spider-Man swinging through New York wouldn't be iconic if he could fly, and now that Wonder Woman can fly, she's robbed of something similar with her lasso. A lot of fights just become trivial. Street-level justice is no longer going to have any tension or creativity. It'll be Superman without x-ray powers. The invisible jet, as mentioned earlier, is worthless. Being agile on the ground isn't important, so all the cool choreographed slides and jumps and kicks and stuff are worthless. The lasso is practically worthless except to make people tell the truth, which, by the way, it never did once in the film. I'm not saying that these things won't be in future films. I'm saying that when they are there, I'll be asking myself, why doesn't she just fly instead? I know this because right after having Wonder Woman fly, they have her swing on clouds or lightning and then have her lasso onto a jet. And all I could think to myself is, what's the point? Imagine if instead of flying, she could lasso lightning and so she took advantage of a thunderstorm to swing her way to Max Lord. Or maybe she could fly, but only with her wingsuit. So it becomes something more than just a piece of armor protecting an already practically invulnerable person. Side note, it's kind of weird that she flies more without the wingsuit than when she has it and the wings are only used as a shield. I don't know, that's just, it's just kind of weird. Something like terrible, but it's just kind of weird. Anyway, the whole point of this is that flight is very, very powerful. Especially when you pair it with super strength, agility, and imperviousness to bullets. It's very hard for an action scene to have any stakes when you know that there's nothing that anyone can do to really stop your hero. Wonder Woman, as of right now, is basically the best parts of Superman, but without the kryptonite weakness. It's overpowered. We already have a Superman, or at least I think we do. I don't know, maybe they're positioning Diana to be the Superman of the group, and they're just not going to replace Superman for a while. I mean, who knows what DC is doing with their plans and everything. It seems to change, like, every week. I don't know. The point is, I like the space Wonder Woman occupied in the DC universe, power level-wise, and now she's just another Superman, and it kind of bums me out. I know I spent a lot of time on what's probably not a huge issue in this movie, but I'd bet money that this will annoy me in Wonder Woman 3 unless they somehow retcon the power away, which would only be marginally less annoying. So that's some of the other dumb stuff. Now let's get into the core structural stuff that I didn't like. 1. Wonder Woman Honestly, the worst part of the Wonder Woman film was Wonder Woman herself. Wonder Woman 1 was a decent fish-out-of-water story that had Diana struggle with her perception of humankind. Her arc was being less naive about good and evil. She thought that humans were all good and any evil must be from some magic god. After all, if you were to think about it on a surface level, why would a civilization or a species constantly be at war with itself? Her seeing the dark side of humanity and still thinking they're worth fighting for, in spite of that, is her arc. In Wonder Woman 84, 
her entire arc is, to paraphrase, I miss Steve. And he's in the picture for most of the movie. She really doesn't have a lot of conflict in this movie. Her conflict is more focused on everybody else's conflict, but not in a way where she has to learn anything like the first movie, or where she has anything to teach anybody, or really anything... It leaves Wonder Woman as the least interesting character in her own movie, and that's just sad. Point two, Cheetah. Cheetah needed room to breathe. She has a good story and a good performance by Wig, but aside from the quick origin story, nothing is really developed on her end. She went from a good person to a bad person in the first act of the movie. We didn't see her much before she was a bad person, and then she became a Cheetah. 3. Max Lord. He is the best part of this movie. Pedro Pascal does a great job, very well performed, and is probably the best written character in this entire movie. Easily the most nuanced villain in the DCEU. Definitely gives a lot of Marvel villains a run for their money. And he should not have been in this movie. He is the reason we don't have a lot of Cheetah, who I honestly think would work better as a sequel villain than Max Lord. Max Lord could be a villain in the third movie, but I think the second movie setting up a sort of rivalry between Wonder Woman and Cheetah would have been better. Maybe have a character that's going to be reoccurring, kind of like the Loki of this franchise. I don't know. Either way, I think that Max Lord didn't belong in the sequel. And as for another person that didn't belong in the sequel, point number four, Steve. Take him out too. Bringing back Steve, the movie after you killed him, doesn't really do anything emotionally or thematically. When you bring a character back, it's usually to induce some kind of nostalgia, maybe to demonstrate how much the main character has changed because you compare their interactions with the originally dead character before they were dead and then after they've been resurrected. But bringing back Steve the movie after you've killed him doesn't really produce any kind of nostalgia moment. I'm not really longing for Steve alongside Diana when I just got it last movie. I do think that bringing back Steve could have been cool in a third movie after Wonder Woman has had a solo venture without him where she grew into like a different person and then you could have that change be a tension in their relationship. Did Diana's love for Steve stay even after she's changed in his absence? Do they still work as even friends? Where do they stand? But including him right after the first movie seems like they had no faith in Wonder Woman carrying her own project. And again, it's just sad. Like, she can do it. Like, you just gotta give her the chance and give her the right story. I mean, any any story can be written well or done poorly. I don't know. I just feel like this is a marketing move, maybe. I don't know. I don't know why they did it, but they shouldn't have done it. In point number five the plot. It starts off kind of small scale, just like a business tycoon making some sketchy deals as a way to fit into the worst of American culture and quote unquote make something of himself. But once the nukes start going off and the wishes get crazy, it becomes too large scale too fast. The structure of this movie seems weird. It's like a romantic comedy kind of thing one moment, but then it's like a superhero movie the other, a small scale hero story, Pedro Pascal is like a second protagonist, but is also the villain. None of it really makes any sense. None of it flows too well. A lot of stuff happens, so the pacing isn't like super slow or anything. At least in the second half of the movie. In the first half, it's pretty slow. It's supposed to be like a Richard Donner Superman flying with Lois Lane kind of moment with the scene where they're in the plane looking at the fireworks. I get what they're going for, but it just, it's like a whole bunch of stuff just seems like it's there, but it doesn't fit together. And it's maybe kind of decent in isolation some of the time, but together it just feels clunky and bad. I don't know. So those are the top five logical things that I didn't really like in the movie, which basically was the entire movie. Uh, so take that what you will. I might make a second video on how I would change Wonder Woman 84 to not be what it was. 
And it's not going to be me trying to salvage the plot. I would just throw everything out almost and just start over again from the scratch. But I don't know. There's a video I want to do on Wonder Woman. There's a few other videos that I want to do. Let me know in the comments what kind of videos you want to see if you care. And uh, like or dislike if you could. And thanks for listening to me ramble. Bye.